have for today is um, humans as sensors. Um, I think uh, that uh, most of what we said so far uh, related to thinking of efforts that were performed by humans in either a coordinated way, so we were discussing collective intelligence as a form of organizing uh, the way people worked together, uh, or uh, in case many one would consider more, the, 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 let's say, the, the concept of the wisdom of crowds, when we do not need uh, people to coordinate their work, but uh, we need to, to, to get a lot of responses from different people, and then we, we find a way of aggregating their answers or by you know, calculating uh, means, calculating um, the median, or calculating whatever uh, statistics that allows us to, let's say, cut out the bias and keep the, the wisdom or keep the knowledge of each one of those individuals in uh, our final uh, decision, for example. Uh, nowadays, uh, so, uh, so, so today, what we will we'll be doing is thinking of uh, each one of us as a sensor in a system that uses us to collect data that can later be used, or later, or in fact not even later, it can be used in real time, many times, to, let's say, to provide more intelligent services or to provide information that leads to better uh, decisions by decision makers in different uh, fields. Of course, after we see all the possibilities of using humans as sensors, it will be impossible for us not to think about our privacy. We, we do gain a lot from, from uh, accepting uh, being used as sensors because we, we do gather a lot of information that can be used for the, the common good. But at the same time, we, we do get a lot of information about uh, the crowds that can be used for other purposes that are not necessarily for the common good. So, uh, and this is the reason why in, uh, in our uh, next class we will already be talking about is this leading us to a more intelligent society or is it uh, leading us to a situation where uh, there will be surveillance uh, and, and the, the government or whoever will be watching out all our steps to make sure that we do whatever has been planned by you know whoever whoever is more powerful uh, uh, and uh, in that sense reducing our freedom reducing our uh, possibility of uh, being what we are and who we are okay uh, but for today we will still uh, focus on the on, uh, let's say on the more optimistic perspective of uh, humans as sensors uh, and we will discuss a few papers uh, that tried to figure out ways of using uh, this data that can be collected from us uh, to, to do good things. Right? Um, and in fact, of course, we are, we, it's not that when we say that humans are used as sensors, it's not the humans themselves, but it is the technological artifacts that we carry on us. Uh, nowadays, the most obvious one is the smartphone, uh, but in addition to the smartphone, we may have several uh, other almost embedded technologies. Not at, at this moment, not yet embedded, but that could be embedded uh, very soon. There are pe people that have smart watches, uh, people that, are, that use whatever kind of uh, sensor, uh, people that have some diseases and have to monitor the, let, let's say, the level of uh, sugar in their blood, will have sensors that will keep feeding, uh, um, uh, let's say, a knowledge base with that information uh, in real time for a doctor to take a decision or for the, the person, uh, him or herself, to take some some action. So, the I mean, all that we can what we can forecast for the future is that uh, we will use many more that there will be many more devices connected to our body or that we carry uh, with us uh, all the time or most of the time that will work as sensors, providing uh, systems with information with respect to us. Um, the, the, the main paper for today was a paper by Professor Thiago Silva. He's one of our colleagues here at the, the Applied Computing uh, Program at uh, UTFPR. Uh, and some of his colleagues, most of them are from uh, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, where, where Thiago was once uh, a doctoral student uh, a few years ago. Uh, and, um, and the reason I chose this paper specifically uh, is because uh, it provides us with a lot of examples of how we are being used as sensors in what uh, has been usually uh, called uh, urban computing, or sometimes it's also called social computing. Uh, of course, there's a, a subtle difference between 
uh, urban uh, computing and, and social computing because urban computing needs to happen in a urban environment. And social computing doesn't necessarily need to, to reflect a, a, a urban uh, environment. Uh, so what I would say is most researchers, when they, when they use urban computing as a keyword for their research, they're talking about uh, many times uh, large cities uh, in which they can collect a lot of data based on uh, sensors, uh, and, and those sensors can be either that humans are being tracked all the time, of course, it still depends on, on our acceptance to that, uh, or even if they're not being tracked all the time, about signals or that they are, or, or information that they provide from specific uh, uh, locations. And in that sense, uh, Tiago and, and his colleagues emphasize the possibility of using uh, social networks that are location-based. So a term that is coined here, well, it's not, it was not Tiago who coined the term, but a term that is used a lot, not only in this first paper here, but in all of the other papers that I, I kept there as suggestions for your reading, is that, uh, uh, at least for the moment, one way of collecting information from people is from uh, location-based social networks. What are the most obvious location-based social networks? Well, uh, those that, uh, that require that you say where you are. So, for example, uh, or, or those that, even if they don't require, they allow you to say uh, where you are, or they, 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 or they, they ask you for, for, permi for permission to see where you are at the time that you express um, whatever feeling or whatever, when you say whatever you say on, the, uh, on a social network. So some, some social networks are, are really uh, seem to be shaped to, to allow for this data collection. Uh, there are those that usually uh, emphasize the place. Right? So um, uh, Tiago and I wrote a paper which is not, I don't think it's included here, or maybe it is. Uh, oh, it is. It's, the third, the, it's the, this uh, third paper here, the suggestions, exploring collected uh, intelligence from untapped to support the location decision of new SMEs. SMEs are small and, and mid-sized enterprise, uh, enterprises. Um, and we use Untapped. Untapped is one of these location-based social networks. It's a very specific uh, location-based social network for beer drinkers or for, for beer lovers, let's say. Uh, and basically what it invites its users to do is to say what beer they're drinking and where they're drinking it. And, uh, you know, which seems to be a very naive uh, application. Uh, and I cannot say, I cannot tell you what the intention of those who, who wrote the code, who, who, who built the application, had as their intention. I, 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 we, we never, we were never very deep into figuring out what their business model was. Uh, but we found out, and, and we, we, we use this paper here as an example of how we regular people can uh, collect data from these uh, location-based social networks that will provide us with information that is important for our decision-making, in this case, for example, as entrepreneurs. If we were to decide on building a or starting a beer business in Brazil, where would that be? Well, this paper sort of tells you, and it, it was very cheap data collection, so we didn't have to, to hire, not that we had the intention to, build, to, to start a business like that, right, but we didn't have to hire expensive uh, uh, consultant uh, firms to help us decide uh, the best places. Uh, and in fact, the, the information that we got and that made the decision possible um, was not uh, uh, information that would lead everyone to the same decision. For example, one of the things that we noticed, and maybe I'll, even, I'll, I'll do this in a chaotic way, I'll be talking about several of these papers. I know that you read, you focused your reading on the first one, but I want to show you a bit of uh, what is possible to do with uh, location-based social networks. So let me very quickly open uh, this uh, paper here and try and show you what we what we found out, and, and, and that will lead maybe different decision makers to different to different uh, um, let's say decisions, right? Uh, well, the first thing is, of course, we were collecting data from from Untapped worldwide because it's not a Brazilian application. And in fact, that was a problem for our study because it is an app. It is an app that uh, I don't know how it is today, this I'm talking about some five, six years ago, uh, maybe a little more than that. Um, the, the, the app was in English, so I mean, considering that we were interested on data in Brazil, that is already a limitation because 
you know, we are, collected, we are collecting some biased data in the sense that not only people who speak English drink beer, right? And in fact, maybe this may be a more exclusive part of the, 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 the population. So this is an information that needed to be taken into account. For example, if we were the entrepreneurs thinking of a business, if we're thinking of a more fancy business uh, for, and, consider, and again, assuming that those, those Brazilians that speak English uh, are wealthier than the average of the Brazilians, uh, that would be need to uh, we would need to take that into account, right? But anyway, the first idea here with this uh, first map was uh, to, it was to show where uh, we, we were able to collect data from. Notice that uh, in fact we this probably also uh, shows to some extent where people enjoy drinking beer in the world, right? Uh, again, to some extent because this information is biased. I cannot say that people in Africa don't drink beer. Maybe they are not as connected to the internet or they, they were not as connected to the internet in, uh, when was this, 2015, I believe, or just figure out, uh, 20, doesn't show, 2016, okay. So if it was published in 2016, uh, we wrote this in 2015, possibly. So in 2015, what we, uh, maybe, uh, you know, the, the internet was not available to, as available in Africa as it were in other parts, and in fact, it was probably not as available in Brazil as in North America or Europe. As, so this is not necessarily showing us just you know where people are drinking beer it's, it's showing where people are using untapped to tell us where they're drinking beer okay but anyway it's it's better information than 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 having nothing uh, it's just that you have to take care to with, with respect to the biases that you introduce when you collect the data collect data like that notice what happened when we we uh, as, as the, the as this uh, location-based social network uh, invites users not only to, to say where, uh, where they are, but also to say what they're drinking. That is what happened in uh, four little cities. And we use here this clouds, of, uh, word, uh, uh, word clouds, which is not a very sophisticated statistic, but it uh, already shows us some, some difference between these four locations. Right? What would you, just by seeing them here, assume about these four cities in which we collected data? By the way, those were four cities where we la had a lot of uh, data being collected, which means that there were, there were more people using Untapped to, to tell us what beer they were drinking. And by the way, uh, the way that they, they, they taught us was that uh, Untapped, whenever you used the, the app, it was connected at, at that stage with uh, Twitter. So it generated a tweet, and it generated a tweet that also had geolocation. So this is how we know where people were. Uh, and, and it was a very structured Twitter in which uh, people basically had to select what they were drinking and many times where they were drinking. So let's have a look at these four cities. Just just looking at that, what assumptions can we can we make? Creativity uh, seems to be more varied in what it brings, while Rio de Janeiro seems to have a really big preference for like Yeah. Well, I think that pro probably if we went to check the numbers of the beer industry in Rio. You, you, you would probably be disappointed to see that Heineken was not the big thing, and maybe the big thing was Brahma, or, right? But the Brahma drinkers are not people that, that, that would go to Untapped and say, hey, I came here to, to this pub to drink a Brahma, right? It's not, it's not uh, let's say, it's not, a, um, it's not fashionable. Again, think of this, this thing as, as being some, a little trendy, right? People, are, they want to say that they're in a sophisticated, it's probably a more sophisticated place, or, or with, they're with friends, but they're, and they, they want to talk about the, the, the good beer that they're drinking. This already shows that people probably, at, this, at least this more assuming, notice it's, it's a risk to assume things, but uh, in, uh, entrepreneurs assume many things many times, more than, than we academics uh, do, I'm taking care here, but and, uh, if, if I were just an entrepreneur, I would say, hey, it seems that, uh, well, first of all, it seems that these guys who use Untapped, they, they're all looking for um, a little more sophisticated beers than the beers that we used to drink in the past. At this time, in 2015, it was a time where everyone was into, um, um, not necessarily home brewing, but uh, into experimenting with, uh, with uh, beers that were not so industrial, right? Um, I, I just see that in Rio we see uh, Heineken is the big thing, it was the big thing then uh, here, and Antarctica Original was, notice, it's not just any Antarctica, it's Antarctica Original that was already marketed by, by Ambev, let's say, as uh, something at that stage still a little a little a little better than the, the average uh, beer, uh, but uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, it seems that in Curitiba and in Belo Horizonte, see the people are more. They're talking about it's, the, 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 
no, there, there's no name here that shows so big, but it, it, there's more variety. And having more variety means people are experimenting more. Again, as we're assuming all these things, right? But they're experimenting more with different uh, beers uh, and um, th th than in, in Rio and Sao Paulo. So again, for, for a decision maker, for an entrepreneur, uh, and even if, if the intention of this entrepreneur was to, let's say, start a business of a uh, fancy new uh, um, uh, art craft beer, let's say, a beer that was uh, not, not an industrial beer, where do you think that the choice would be for Sao Paulo or Rio or Curitiba or Belo Horizonte? I think we were going to Curitiba where we're experimenting. And the second option would be Sao Paulo, who has high income but isn't that... Uh, that big, that dominant. That dominant uh, would be a market so available for a more fashionable beer. Yeah. I, I would guess, again, uh, uh, Word, uh, word clouds, uh, they, are, they give us some hints, right? Uh, I would guess here that uh, Heineken is, was as big in Sao Paulo as in Rio, it's simply that notice that Sao Paulo had more people answering simply because Sao Paulo is three times as large as Rio. Uh, I don't know. Uh, so I would say that those two markets, again, assumptions here, are less sophisticated. They are still drinking their Brahmas and, and, and there are less people that are interested in in a double Vienna lager, for example. If you ask those people in Sao Paulo, what, they would say, what is that, right? Let's see if we, if, we, if we find a double Vienna lager here, it may be very small somewhere there, right? But, and, and over here, it seemed that at that stage, for whatever reason, maybe, maybe it was a pub that was, uh, but uh, the Irish red ale, right? The American pale ale, these are all, this is showing that, the, that there was a brief brewing movement happening in, in Curitiba and in Belo Horizonte, God save the queen, I don't know uh, this, beer, but it's probably a local beer from them, but it's, it shows that there was, let's say, there were less industrial beers were seemed to be more in demand in Curitiba and Belo Horizonte than in Sao Paulo and Rio, okay? But again, if you're an entrepreneur, you, it depends on if you want to be the pioneer or a follower that wants to take advantage of the fact that others have already shown that there is some markets there. So I'd say that maybe someone would say, I would go to Sao Paulo or Rio to start my, my craft beer uh, enterprise because no one has done that. You know, it seems that it, it, uh, there, there's very, there will be very li little competition for my product. I will have to do a lot of advertising and everything because people don't know it. And, 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 and another decision maker could say, well, I will start my business in Curitiba or Belo Horizonte because people already know what craft beer is about. Uh, and then I don't have to spend so much on advertising, on, on convincing the markets that I have a good product. People will, will, so it depends, again, uh, data allow different decision makers to take different decisions, right? There's, but there's argument uh, uh, that would support any of those decisions depending on the intention of, of, of each of the, of the decision makers there, right? Um, but notice, so, so uh, we were, in fact, this was fun, we were, uh, Thiago and I were drinking a beer one day, and we, we thought, and, and he had shown me this untapped um, app that I did not know. Um, and uh, we said, yes, and he showed me, of course, it's, it, academians drinking a beer is different to other people drinking beers, right? Because uh, he, we were drinking beers, but he was also, he had comp his computer with him and he was showing me someone who had done already some research on untapped uh, somewhere else in the world. And I said, look, this is a good example that we can use uh, for my collective intelligence classes or for his, his really into social computing or urban computing, which is based, I, I keep telling him that what, all, all that he does is based on collective intelligence. Uh, he thinks that I'm, I'm trying to put his uh, research area down. No, of course not. It's, I'm, I'm actually saying that uh, the principles of collective intelligence are what make the, the research that he does so, so, so interesting. Uh, and so we, we were having fun and, and this was a paper that we wrote. I remember we wrote this paper in three days because we wanted to submit it uh, to this uh, conference. Uh, and so it was really fast, because it's not a very sophisticated uh, paper. It's, it's, it was just to give examples of how, how we can use that. And uh, well, there's a few more. Uh, we noticed, for example, here, where people uh, were located uh, in, in, in different cities. Uh, and that also shows uh, Tiago was interested in figuring out if there was a, uh, an area in Curitiba that clustered most of the, those craft beer uh, places uh, that, that, that maybe the, the mayor could call the, the beer route of Curitiba or something. And he was already, in fact, a little inspired by another paper 
that I will show you here, that is that one about the path to, uh, it's not the path to happiness, it's, uh, I have it in my paper here, it's the, uh, the, shortest path, uh, the shortest path to happiness, that we'll, we'll, we'll discuss soon. So he was trying to see if, if there was the shortest path to, to, to happiness, uh, in, in his case, uh, if, if there was, a, if, if, if you could show people how to, to go from one, be a place to the other, in, in places like Curitiba, and, but this is not something that we did in this paper here. Um, I noticed that uh, the same way we asked people about um, about uh, what beer they were drinking, uh, well, we asked, uh, we collected information of what beer they, they drank. We also asked where they were drinking that, and we see here that in places like Curitiba and Belo Horizonte, these were probably trendy. Most of them were trendy pubs at the time, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if people just wrote here drinking beer, well, see, yeah, condominium, spatio, luxor, or whatever. So it just seems that, uh, I don't know how big this condominium is, but it's, many times people were drinking with friends at home, and uh, I don't know if I had some pun up, okay. Right, so, uh, so this was, uh, this shows that we, we can even, from naive applications, uh, again, nowadays, I, I think that many, many people are using, or are creating some um, applications like this to explore and to exploit Remember the difference between exploring and exploiting. To explore is to understand, and then to exploit is to benefit from, from the knowledge that you can generate. Um, this week I had a, a, an undergraduate student, a student coming to, to, to my, my office uh, because he wants to build a collective intelligence um, device, uh, application to help people find uh, the products that, that they want to buy at a cheaper price. Right? Uh, here in, in our state, in Paraná, where, where Curitiba is located, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the local government, the state government has uh, collects data on every um, every uh, bill that uh, every how do you call it? I think it's a, every invoice that is given by shops. So if we look at their app, at the, the government's app, it will say if you want to, to figure out the price of uh, I don't know uh, a, a, a bottle of milk. Uh, it will show different supermarkets and show how, how that price is, is given. But it's, uh, it, it's the, 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 although the idea is good, uh, it's, uh, the app is not very, very easy to, let's say, to, 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 to use. Uh, and many times the products are not, you, you're not able to, to be sure if you're, if you're talking exactly about the same product or products that are sort of similar. And he, and he was, uh, what I was suggesting him to do was to, to work on, on niche markets. For example, nowadays we have a lot of people that um, well, they, 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 they need gluten-free um, products. And it's still challenge, uh, uh, challenging to find those products in, in, in the supermarkets and, and many times they're more expensive. So I, I told him you, what you could do is you ask well, well, pe people who, are, who will be using your app, they go to a supermarket or, or they go to whatever place that sells products that, uh, that are good for, for, their, for their needs and well, they they they, sh they take a photo of the let's say the the, the barcodes, uh, and they put the price that they find there. And it, uh, of course, it, it will either have to be um, uh, geolocated, or people will have to, to expressly tell where they are. If they're in a supermarket, if they're in a little store, or whatever, they have to say where they are. But then, notice first they feed the system with uh, the information that they have from that place. And as, as soon as they do that, the the system provides them back the price for that same product in other places that was fed by other people. So again, we're using the collective intelligence, uh, in this case, to, to, to help a collective figure out uh, who uh, uh, or where a specific product is being sold by the lowest uh, or for the lowest price. Right? Uh, well, it's still at the very beginning stage of uh, developing this app, but we, yeah. There was a, a ticket from Paraná about uh, gas prices. They For use the gasoline, gasoline yeah, yeah the, the uh, receipt, uh -huh. and the government gets about uh, the gas station and the mm -hmm. price, mm -hmm. and he, the author managed to make an app on that, All right. that said where was the lowest price on gas. Uh -huh. And that's a collective intelligence, again, you, 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 we have to always think what is the definition of collective intelligence that we're using. If, we're only, if we want, only want a very restrictive collective intelligence definition that says, well, it's it's using the efforts of a lot of people to provide benefits to a lot of people. Uh, uh, well, we could argue that that's, that's the case, but in this case, it, it's, we could also say that it's first the effort of some person to put together the application, 
that will collect information from many users, or in this case, actually, will collect information from the directly from the state's controlled invoices. Uh, you know, for, for all, the, all people that bought gas in different uh, petrol stations, uh, and uh, so, but it's it's definitely collective intelligence. And and I find that uh, doing this in niche opportunities uh, can even. Uh, provides uh, you know the the app builder uh, with the possibility of turning that into business because uh, the information that is being gathered and of course legislation is becoming um, each time more conscious about the fact that we are giving out uh, giving up sorry we are giving out much more information about ourselves than than we should so that we're starting to have a lot of different ways of protecting that uh, and again we, we who, who want to work with collective intelligence we have to be very uh, very ethical uh, in, in, in our in our intentions uh, of, of using it, uh, but, but and, and, and I defend that that we do that. But at the same time, I defend capitalism uh, in the sense that well, if someone finds a way that he can make the lives of others better, more convenient, and still get a, a share, get a profit out of that, I don't see a problem. Uh, so in, the, in that say, in the sense, I think that it's possible to build. Uh, an application out of the collective intelligence of all people that are in need of finding, finding products that are cheaper to respond to their needs, uh, even if that will help uh, Carlos, a student of mine, uh, get rich. No problem with that. You, if you get rich, allowing others to, to get uh, richer together with you, or at least less poor or more informed or whatever, perfect. And uh, we, we just uh, shouldn't get people uh, imprisoned by, by, by what we do. Uh, okay. Uh, Let's go back to the to the to our main uh, paper for today. So it's this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I just realized now that uh, I have I was not showing my my. I, I was talking here and I was not showing my screen. Right to to you guys. Please remind me when I when I do that because uh, I, I was showing all the screens with with the the diagrams here to, to to my only student in class and everyone who's online was trying to guess what I was talking about. Uh, I'll, I'll very quickly just uh, let me just change scenes here. Uh, I was very quickly just go back to, to, to the paper, the tap paper here, just to show you uh, what, what. So I, I hope some of you were smart enough to go there, look at the, look, look at the, 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 our Moodle page and find where those things were. But I was, I show, I've shown you first this map of the world uh, where uh, I showed that we, we have less people using, we had less people using untapped in Brazil than in other parts of the world, uh, and then I showed you, the, and this is why I only had responses from whoever was in class. I showed you <laughs> these clouds, these words of clouds here, for um, the cities of São Paulo, Rio, Curitiba, and Minas Gerais, and, and Belo Horizonte, were, which were the cities where more people were using the app, uh, and where it's clear that in São Paulo. Uh, and, and mainly in Rio here, people were less sophisticated. Less sophisticated. And notice, they were already sophisticated. The users of Untapped were already sophisticated compared to the to, 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 to the to the Brahma drinkers because Heineken, at least uh, the marketing of Heineken, is uh, a marketing of a, a a beer that although uh, produced in large scales, that is still um, well, closer to. To, 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 or to, to the standards of the, the, craft, uh, the craft beers, let's say it's, it's a beer that is made out of uh, uh, real malt and not uh, corn, uh, corn sugar, as many of the cheapest beers we have. Okay? And uh, then I also showed you, uh, I think, uh, what is this? Um, uh, here, where people drink uh, beers. So again, uh, you just have to remind me because otherwise I will forget. And I'll keep uh, talking to you, looking at you here, but. Uh, but you, you don't know what, I'm, what I have in my, on, on my screen. All right, so the, now the, the, the paper that, that you read was this paper by, again, Thiago, Thiago Silva and some of his colleagues, most of them uh, from, from, from the, the Federal University of Minas Gerais, where they have a lot of people dis uh, studying uh, urban computing and, and social computing. They, they don't use the term collective intelligence very often because their, their main focus is not on collective intelligence, as a phenomenon, although they use collective intelligence all the time to collect data for their for their research, uh, I just want to quickly go through the paper here and show a few things that you should think of. It's a survey, so they're talking. They refer to many of the papers or to many papers 
uh, that will, you, you will see that are either appear here as suggestions or as uh, yeah or, or as, as, as papers that that, that that you have to read for for a class sometimes, uh, and then. Uh, of course, it's written in a very academic way, so it has an introduction where it talk, talks about the relevance of the research and then provides us with an objective and so on and so forth, and explains what urban computing is. Remember, it's important that when we're talking to other researchers that they understand what we mean by the, the terms that we use. Uh, and uh, in this uh, case here, that they say, say the typical urban data sources uh, are, of course, directly from the city infrastructure. For example, here in Curitiba, all our buses uh, are geolocated, so we, we can know where each bus is at each time, and this can be used in uh, urban computing to 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 know, um, you know, to even to, to study how to develop further the the collective uh, the public con public transportation uh, facilities of the city. We also have, considering that most people do not pay uh, their tickets for for the transport in money, most people use a card, a city card for that, they can also have, maybe not in, in real time, but there is also the information where each person that uses this, the, the, the system, where they got into the, into the, into the bus, right? Um, and we, we know where people get into the bus in the morning, we know where they get into the bus late in the afternoon. So we, it's, it's sort of uh, easy to assume that uh, the bus that people take in the morning is uh, to go from home to work or to I mean to, to school or whatever, and the, the one that people take in the after, late in, late in the, in the day is to come back home. So there's a lot of information that is uh, collected by by the city infra infrastructure and, 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 that, and that can be used for building um, what, what Tiago and, and his colleagues here are calling urban computing, but we could be easily calling a collective intelligence uh, engine. Uh, then he mentions here that the location-based uh, social networks. We have already, well, we talked about the little one, that, that this niche one, untapped for, for beer. Uh, we've already, it's connected to, to it was connected to Twitter, uh, which is another, uh, I, I believe that Twitter can also be considered location-based, at least to some of the people, because if people don't mind providing their location, the location will go along with, um, with whatever message people were tweeting, and this allows us, for example, uh, to figure out a lot, think of, well, Twitter got a very, because of some of the characteristics of these social networks, some of them are more used for, for some intents. Twitter was used a lot for political reasons. So think of how easy it was to collect information from Twitter and geolocate uh, that to know where people express whatever sort of uh, opinions about politics, for example. There was the case of a uh, politician that was being uh, investigated for case of violence and other things, and people and the police wasn't going after him in the moment because he was missing. But he tweeted his location, uh -huh. and because he, he, he tweeted his location, the police went after him and got him arrested. There was another man in Romania. He was being searched because of accusations of human trafficking, but he was not. Uh, but uh, he fled the country, so the, the police in the country couldn't get to him. Uh -huh. But he went back and posted a picture of, of geolocated in Romania and with the picture of a uh, pizzeria of Romania. Uh -huh. So the police got to him and now he's arrested. Yeah. Well, those are not cases of collective intelligence because uh, th th those are cases of, of uh, geolocation uh, being used to get information. Uh, it's not collective intelligence because it's it's about one it's single person. Huh? It's not intelligence. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, but, but one thing that we have to notice is that uh, the collective intelligence doesn't happen necessarily in an intended way, right? Uh, most people share information in uh, that they don't they don't realize that they're sharing or they don't realize the, the let's see the uh, the extent to which that is being shared. Uh, in fact whatever thing you write on social networks that you think the only ones who are interested on this will be my friends. So, you know, what I post here will be lost in the middle of the posts of millions of other people. So I'm sort of hidden in the crowds. You may be individually hidden in the crowds in the sense that uh, if we're not uh, targets for, you know, for the, uh, for the police or for, for, or for the criminals, sometimes we may be uh, target also, not, not from, from, for the police, but uh, others may have interest on, on us or where we are or whatever. Uh, but if we're, if, if we're lost in the crowds, we're still providing important information about how we behave as members of the crowd. And uh, additionally to that, after 
after uh, a sense is made of the information that the crowd provides whoever wants to uh, analyze uh, the data, then we can be targeted again individually because uh, individuals can be uh, clustered in, uh, in smaller groups within a larger crowd that can be targeted uh, for advertisements or for political uh, or political campaigns or whatever. In fact, I don't know how many of you uh, saw those documentaries on, on Cambridge Analytics that, that, that were featured uh, on Netflix and, and I think on, on Netflix a few years ago about the elections in the, the 2016 elections in the United States. Well, that was collective intelligence being used to gather information from the crowds uh, and then a segmentation of that, uh, of, of that knowledge to know who you would target with whatever uh, message. Uh, so we have to, again, this is already to show, you, uh, show us that we have to be careful about how collective intelligence is used because it's not necessarily used for the good of the crowds. It may be used for the manipulation of the crowds. Uh, and I would, I would say that uh, politically that's the way it has been used by, by different, and it's not, uh, although we notice that some political groups seem to be more specialized on that, uh, it doesn't mean that they're the only ones that are using it. And in fact, the others are not using it only because they're not as competent in using it. Here in Brazil, we have this debate right now about um, you know, restrictions to social networks. And my impression is only because we have different kinds of weird politicians, right? Some of them have been more competent in the past of using the social networks to influence the masses. And the others uh, that are less competent on that, as, say, uh, as untrustable as, uh, wishing to, let's say, to, to, to quiet them out by in, you know, creating a sp specific legislation for the, for the social networks. Again, the social networks need, need uh, I, I think that uh, well, the, the internet and, and the, the way data is collected and is used about people definitely needs to be, um, uh, we need to have legislation about that. Uh, Technological progress has happened more quickly than our society has been able to deal with it. Uh, a lot of the problems that we have related to, to social networks today were not necessarily planned in advance. It was not that someone 20 years ago thought, yes, we will shape the internet so to, 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 to work in a specific way uh, because we want to manipulate uh, people. Or even if, if there was any intention of manipulating people, they were probably not thinking of uh, political manipulation, they were thinking about economical manipulation, which ends up being as harmful as, um, but uh, yeah, we'll have to discuss that. Next class is, is where we're going to be a little more critical about uh, uh, our technologies here. We, we, we do tend as humans to, to be amused by our own technologies, to enjoy technologies for the sake of them being there and, and being available, uh, but we do, maybe we should be more careful in the development and the use we make of those technologies if we want to build uh, a better society in the future. But let's go back here to their model. So they, they, they also, uh, they, uh, Thiago and, and his colleagues use for, uh, Foursquare many times in their research, simply because again, Foursquare as untapped, it is sort of a niched uh, uh, social network. People go to Foursquare to say, in fact, to say where they are and what they're doing, right? So people, people check in, right? Uh, check in in, in Foursquare. Uh, I have never been a, a user of Foursquare, so I don't know it as well, but I know that people go to a restaurant and they say, yeah, I've been here and I ate whatever food, and, uh, or, or they go to a park and they check in, and checking in, the, in different places provides us with um, the possibility of, again, understanding, uh, let's say, the flow in a city, uh, understanding the cultural aspects of a society. This paper will show, and, and in fact, there's another paper by by Thiago and, and his colleagues, uh, which is the large scale, where is it? Uh, large scale, sorry, large scale study of city dynamics and urban social behaviors, right? Uh, this is a, a paper that goes deeper into, uh, into doing something that this paper here only suggests. That is, we can even understand the culture of, uh, of a city based on the check-ins people perform on Foursquare, for example. Uh, it will appear, in, 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 this paper here already shows a little a hint on that. And then, uh, of course, after you collect all that data, you need 
Uh, and this, you, you can still get statistical data from other sources, such as like census, uh, other information that you, you collect either from the, from the internet or from any other data source. And, uh, well, many times, or, or each time more often, also physical sensors like the Internet of, of Things. Uh, well, and, and nowadays, if you think of all the cameras that we have uh, around the city, uh, all of them providing information that can, in, in some, sometimes, can become uh, available to, to researchers or to, or, or to companies or whatever. In other cases, that's, um, again, it, uh, the, the more information we get from this, devices, the, the more we are exposing people's privacy. So there, there, there is legislation and there is a concern about how open these things are. But the fact is that we do have a lot of uh, ways of collecting this uh, information, either by uh, through physical sensors, I'm trying to highlight here, physical sensors, or they also mention, as it had already shown before the infrastructure of cities, uh, data that is, that is collected for people to move around uh, or when they, they go to, uh, when they have any service from the government, statistical data, uh, location-based networks, and so on and so forth. And let me see if I see some of their graphs here. Uh, well, the, here they, they show an overview of the, the framework uh, they use for, for uh, urban computing using location-based social networks data. So they start collecting data from those social networks. There is collection, storage, modeling, and then you have to turn your modeling check, check if that provides you with any knowledge and if that knowledge can help uh, some action to happen. Uh, I'm gonna get to the place where they show the differences, the, the differences in, in cities and, and, and the culture of cities that they could map directly from there. Well, this is an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, analysis of uh, Barack Obama's tweeting uh, during the day. Uh, notice how very simple things, I mean, whoever tweets a message on Twitter uh, is, of course, is, is providing the content of that message, but the simple act of tweeting provides already some information. So for example, here we, we, we know that there, there's some things here are very obvious. When we think uh, in the, well, here, the, the, this uh, vertical axis here, we, we have the time after uh, a tweet, how many, how many minutes, hours, or days between that tweet and the next tweet. And of course, uh, it will be uh, more time uh, if, we're, if we're dealing with the last tweet of the day, so the note, note here on the top, the last tweet of the day, we tweet it and then it may take at least eight hours that you, you wake up in the morning the next day, but many times you may not, uh, may not, you, you may not tweet the next day. It seems that Obama was not someone who was tweeting all the time. If they were doing those, this uh, about Trump, uh, it would be probably uh, much, a much more crowded uh, view here. But from the last tweet of the day, uh, we'll, uh, we, after the last tweet of the day, we will expect to have at least eight hours until the next, or, or at least, I don't know, eight hours if the people, the person sleeps eight hours, right? Are people, and, and, and the level of addiction to, to Twitter. It could be five hours. You, you could already notice. You could figure out important information about how the president of the United States uh, lives his life. You know how many hours he sleeps looking at this. Of course you say, oh, he sleeps two days? No. This is probably the last time. It seems that he probably, have, he probably, it, it, you, you could have checked if those days that, that, that when you had two days, if it was the weekend, that would mean, well, so this is a guy that used Twitter professionally because, and, and, and who did not work on the weekend. But again, you, you're getting some information from, from this guy. Notice that these other ones here, the show here, uh, time between, uh, uh, between tweets. Uh, if you had more than 12 hours, they're saying, well, this is pro pro uh, most probably this, this cluster here is the first tweet of the day, okay? Uh, and then if you have uh, uh, s uh, uh, an intermediate uh, level, uh, number of, of hours here, one hour, and one hour until 12 hours, it says, well, this is the business as usual, right? He tweets in the morning and then he tweets another. It's, like, again, this is the behavior of Mr. Obama, right? And notice what happened here, but they said, well, sometimes, he tweets several times, several times one after the other. This is what they call uh, major events. So think uh, how we can, uh, again, uh, uh, is this, in this case, is it collective intelligence? No, we're talking about, we're collecting intelligence 
of one only person, right? Uh, and again, Thiago Silva is not a collective intelligence researcher. He's a, a, a social computing researcher. So in this case, he's trying to understand this individual here. Uh, but he's saying, if there are many tweets of Mr. Obama one after the other, maybe we better check. So you, you can put a little robot there that is checking. When, when Mr. Obama sent, well, sent a, a tweet and the next tweet came only three hours later, this is the, this is the pattern in between meetings or whatever. But if there was, a, a, I don't know, a North Korea missile uh, that, was, that exploded in Japan or something, then you, 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 you could notice that you have to pay, pay attention to what Mr. Obama was saying because he was tweeting many things one after the other. It means that that was something possibly important for him. Again, just to show that we even crazy uh, data as time between tweets may already have information that needs to be analyzed. Um, and then uh, if they have another, uh, I, I'm, I'm focusing mainly on the, 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 the figures here because uh, they, they, they did a good job of, uh, you know, all these figures, they sort of summarize parts of the, the paper, that, what they're discussing. So I think it, it makes it easier for us here. So they're saying, okay, from, from the information we get from these location-based social networks, we can do urban computing. But what are the interests of those who are doing urban computing? And remember, this paper here is a survey, which means that they're not developing new uh, theories here. They are, they're trying to see what others have done in the past. And they say, okay, so there are people that are using urban computing uh, to work on social and economic aspects of, of the city. There are people that are doing urban computing to understand the city semantics, uh, the meaning of the city, the, how, how city works and everything. It will become clear, clear when, when he shows here, uh, let's say, uh, a picture of, of uh, the information they gather from Sao Paulo and from Hong Kong. Uh, there are people that are, are, that are doing urban computing to, to work on or, to solve city problems, uh, others are, well, urban mobility is a city problem, but uh, it's such a special city problem that they decided to, to, to stress it here. Uh, there are people that are, are doing it to try and improve, improve the quality of health and well-being, uh, and uh, also for events of uh, in, uh, 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 identif identification of interest of, that, that people have and the analysis on that. Uh, so. Uh, okay. Well, uh, now we get to the city semantics. It's, it's interesting that the, the other paper that they wrote, uh, the one on the large scale study of city dynamics and urban social behavior using participatory sensing, that paper is a paper that explores the city semantics much further. But what they're trying to do here is to Understand the city based on the data that you can collect. And I find this really interesting. If you look at, uh, for example, uh, the, where, do people, or where do people go considering where they are right now? Uh, and then uh, uh, they, they, they claim here that, for example, uh, people can go from a place where they are having food, let's say from a, a place where they had breakfast, or, of course, people never... Um, write uh, or tweet or, 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 or check in at home to say I'm having breakfast before going somewhere else. But there are places where people go somewhere to have breakfast. This is not usual here in Curitiba. We, I, I would say that most people in Curitiba have breakfast at home. But in Sao Paulo, for example, many people go to a bakery to have breakfast. Cities are a little different uh, from place to place. People, may, many people go to, to, let's say, the first snack of the day is already outside home. Right? So what are how different are our are, are, are places? Yeah. Of course, for we Brazilians, uh, I would say that mo uh, in general, and, and, and again, it's, it's difficult to generalize that much considering that some live in, in a more subtropical area and others in a very tropical area. Whoever lives in a, 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 by the beach, they may go every day, at the end of the day, they go have a beer at, uh, by the beach, you know, in, in, in a pub uh, to, to get, to get the, the nice breeze. Uh, from, from the ocean at the end of the day. I don't know. Uh, in a place like Curitiba, we'll go home uh, because it, 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 it's cooler. So well, how different are the, the, what is the mood of different cities? And uh, Thiago and his colleagues claim that by developing these heat maps, they figure out cities that at least have similar moods, depending on, on where people go uh, and, and when they go. Right? So there, there are places that after work, people go home. 
Brazilians could say how boring, right? But maybe that's the pattern in, in Kuwait, or maybe that's the pattern in Hong Kong. Uh, and, and again, Brazilians would say how boring, maybe not the Brazilians in Curitiba, where we, we go home after work. <laughs> Uh, it depends. It, it will probably show a little what people do after work or before work or after eating or or before eating. Uh, uh, they claim that tells us a little bit about the the, the, the city already. Okay. I think uh, um, uh, again the, the, the idea of this paper here is to show all the possibilities of gathering this information and figuring out uh, what happens. That they now now have heat maps of smell related tag intensity in London. Um, so uh, smell related, of course, that there are places where if you go to a park and you're there in the middle of the, the bush, uh, you're not going to say, gee, this place smells like uh, carbon dioxide, right? You're going to say, mm, it's, it smells good, it's, it smells fresh. But you, if you are in a, in a traffic jam somewhere, you may say, gee, this place smells better or whatever. Uh, and this even, uh, they, 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 they suggest that we, we can, many times we are focused on figuring out the, the, the shortest path from one place to another, right? This is what uh, the shortest, at least the shortest in time, is what Google Maps provides us. It is what Waze uh, provides us, the shortest, right? Why? Because we're focused on efficiency. Uh, and then, uh, uh, well, again, Tiago and his colleagues here are serving what others have done before. And he said, are people always interested in, in going from one place to the other through the fastest route? Is that what people why are we pushing them to, to, do, to, to go through the fastest, fastest, fastest routes if maybe what they're looking for is the, the nicest, the most beautiful, the quietest route or whatever? If you're traveling you, and, you, and you want to get fast to another place, you will take the freeway. Free, freeway. But if you, if you want to experience, the, let's say, the, the rural areas, if you want to see, maybe you try, and try to, to, to get to, to a smaller uh, route, to a, that will take longer, but that will provide you with different experience. So it's the, the, uh, uh, we're not necessarily always uh, wishing to have, have the, the, the shortest path. And then some researchers took this as their challenge. How could I, for example, if someone wanted to, to find the most beautiful way uh, to go around in a, in a city, how could we, we, we provide them with that information? This would be very uh, important, for example, for tourists. If we, if, if we have here in Curitiba, if we have tourists coming to the city and they are they're going to be walking around uh, downtown, they, they want to go to, to several of, of the uh, several places of interest, are we going to say, get Google Maps and, and find the fastest uh, route from one place to another? Maybe not. Maybe they would like to know it, but I want to experience the city. At the same time, I would like them to avoid some dangerous areas of the city, I don't know. Okay. Uh, so how, where could we get information that would lead to uh, a, the most beautiful path and not necessarily the, the shortest path? Uh, we have another paper here and, and that discusses that. It's, it's this one here. The shortest path to happiness. Recommending beautiful, quiet and happy places, uh, happy routes in the city. Their approach here was uh, simply, of course, it's, it's, it's not perfect. We, we can never do something that is perfect. But they, they thought, well, uh, we can assume that places in a city where people take a lot of photographs are, are I mean, if they took a photograph, it's because it interested them. Okay? So let's see places. And, and then you can uh, use, of course, in this case, I think they did that with uh, Flickr. Uh, it, you, you have to choose uh, a social network that is the one that's that invites people to do something. So there, there are, in this case here, I, I don't recall exactly what, what it was. I think it was Flickr. Flickr uh, allowed people to take pictures and share it. So whenever you took a picture, you shared it, and you shared also your geolocation. Then what these guys do, did, uh, Quercia, Quercia and his uh, colleagues, uh, they thought, well, places where people took a lot of pictures, that has to be an interesting place. Uh, so I will, when, when defining a route from point A to point B, uh, if I can allow people to go through these places where others took pictures, I'm probably providing them with a, a, a route that is not the shortest, but it is the most interesting one. Right? Again, there's the risk that people are taking pictures there because there is a dead body on the... I don't know. <laughs> uh, again, think that whenever we're depending on 
hundreds or thousands or millions of, uh, of uh, data points uh, that, that were provided by, by, by the collective, we never know exactly the reason for that. Okay? We could also, of course, we could improve that by doing some uh, analysis of whatever tag people wrote to that place. If they wrote beautiful, lovely, uh, I don't know, if, if, they, if they wrote something positive, we could, uh, we could target that, well, this is interesting. If they, they, if they wrote scary, horrible, or whatever, maybe you could say, like, this, this is what I want to hide. Right? When foreigners come to Curitiba, uh, we, we do have our path to happiness in the city. It is to take them to take the bus, the, the round bus trip of, uh, around the city that starts uh, right here next to the, the university and that shows some of the most beautiful places of the city. The other day, I remember we had a group of um, professors from Denmark that came to visit uh, and on a Saturday afternoon, it was a sunny day, and I took them around, uh, you know, taking this trip. And when we finished the trip, they said, "Gee, we never thought that we would find in, uh, we find we would find Curitiba to be more more beautiful than uh, the cities that we know in Denmark." And I can assure you that Denmark is a very beautiful country, uh, a very rich country. So their cities tend tend to be uh, beautiful. But they were impressed with with the Curitiba that they saw. Uh, and at that stage when they were saying that, I remember this, uh, this paper by Quercy here and said, yeah, but they don't know that they are in the, this is the shortest path to happiness in Curitiba. We're only going through the beautiful parts of the city. If we had to, sometimes we had just moved three blocks one direction or the other, they would have had a different uh, impression. Um, but anyway, um, okay. So, uh, let me just... Very quickly, you, you see that we had a lot of suggested uh, readings for today. Again, I, I, I don't expect that you you do the suggested readings for for, for for a class. I know that you. I'm competing here for your time. You're doing this course, and you're also doing other courses. It's always very important that you do at least the reading that we, we recommend. Uh, we, we recommend as, in fact, as as, as a compulsory reading. Uh, but at the same time, I uh, I hope that sometimes at least the the titles here uh, are engaging enough so that you decide to read some of these papers, right? Uh, we, we had inspired again on, the, the, on that paper about the happiness, the, the, how, do you, how do you call it, the shortest path to happiness. Uh, uh, Valmir Marques, who was one of our graduate students here a few years ago, decided to write his, uh, his uh, master's dissertation on accessible routes. He said, well, there, there, there are people that will want to go through a route that is the most beautiful. But people on wheelchairs, for example, or blind people, they they do not need to they do not want to go through the shortest path because the shortest path may be risky to them. But they may want to know what is the most accessible path. Right? And then he, he wrote an app that we report in these two two papers here. Uh, yeah, he wrote an app uh, by means of which we could uh, build accessible maps for people either in wheelchairs or uh, or blind people that needed to go to go from one place to the other. We, this of course was our, our plan was that this would uh, be a collective intelligence project in the sense that remember that I keep saying that people do things for money, love, or glory. We did not have any money, so we thought that people would do it for for love in the sense that well, uh, I, I will, you know, when I'm when I'm walking around the city, I will mark places that are. Where the, the the sidewalk is 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 uh, uh, let's say it's full of holes, or where there are poles in the middle of this uh, a pole in the middle of the street, uh, sorry, or in the middle of the, the the sidewalk that that would not be noticeable by 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 a blind person, or or that would not permit someone on a wheelchair. There's not enough room for someone on a wheelchair to go through. Uh, so I will mark those spots, uh, and our intention was that those spots being marked would help those. Uh, people with uh, access, uh, accessibility needs and at the same time would allow the, the governments to be aware of that problem and could hopefully solve it somewhere in the future. Uh, we, one thing that we, it's, it's always a challenge to count on people's love gene, remember uh, Malone Malo tells us about the, the, the genes of collective intelligence, uh, because uh, many times people have other reasons, and in our case here, we understood that one of the difficulties that people had. Well, this was, was a study that was conducted in. It was published in 2019, but this was uh, 2017, 2018 that we were working on this. People at that stage were afraid 
to walk around in the city here in Curitiba with a smartphone in their hands, right? So they didn't think of, of getting the phone out and marking a place. And, and another problem that we probably had there was uh, it wasn't humans as sensors in the sense that people just having their cell phones on, the, on their pockets would alre already mark that. They would have to take their, their, their cell phone out, find the app, mark the, the situation. So we were taking them a little too far away from their track to, so that they did that just for love. Uh, maybe if we had, had the possibility to f develop the, the, the technology a little further and, and people could keep it in their pocket and just say ho or, or, you know, or, or pole or whatever and, and that would mark without them having to, to do the extra work of taking their phone out and everything, uh, maybe we would have more, more people doing that. Um, I can't tell you if the, the app is still running, I haven't checked it lately but uh, we, we, we could not grow a large number of people to feed information in and then of course although we did we did have uh, several meetings with uh, with uh, people from the association of the blind people and and, and, and people in wheelchairs so they were they, they were enthusiastic about the, the, the possibilities of that um, but we have to say again that, and, I, and I'm insisting on this because many times we think oh we're going to do something that is, is great everyone will love it uh, so it will happen and uh, it ends up failing because we were not able to provide the required incentives for people to, to push it further. Right? We did have one city uh, mapped, uh, fully mapped, which was Oakland uh, next to Berkeley in California. And that was for one very simple reason. Uh, it was not for, for love, it was for, for money, uh, for money in the sense that for, for a pragmatic reason. Uh, my, in, in 2018, we were, I, w I was uh, living in, 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 in Albany, uh, I, was, I was there as a visiting scholar in, in Berkeley, and, uh, and my son went to the Albany school, and they needed to do some voluntary work. And then I asked, uh, I gave him the idea, ask with your teachers if the voluntary work that you are going to do, if it's possible that you map the city. And it was a small city, uh, maybe, I don't know, well, not, not that small, some, maybe some, but some 50 blocks. Not nothing compared to Curitiba, some 50 blocks, uh, and he mapped that over two weeks. He went through all the blocks and mapped the whole city, uh, and 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 so we could say that Auckland became a city where, and, and there, there were a lot of people on wheelchairs, and and uh, there was a, there was a city that could, that the people on wheelchairs or blind people could uh, benefit from 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 using that. But I have to tell you that the precisely the the, the collective intelligence bit of uh, what we were doing failed because we were not able to engage people in becoming those sensors uh, because in that, in, that case it was, in that case it was not something without effort. People still had to mark uh, places and to do that. Okay? Um, well, I, I guess uh, those, were, uh, those were the papers that I, that at least that I, I would suggest you to focus a little further. Uh, uh, let me just, maybe the, I told you that the, the the second paper by Thiago and uh, his colleagues at large scale. Let's just see if this is. Let me just show you a little further. Oh, what happened here? Oh, it's broken the link. Okay, so I will not show that today, but I will I'll make sure that I, I, I re included here this large scale study of city dynamics and urban social behavior because uh, in, this, in this case, he really studied several cities around the world and, even, and, and he's able to show how, let's say, the cities in Brazil uh, uh, are more similar among themselves uh, than, and, and have some similarities with some cities in, in other words, uh, in, other, in other parts of the world, uh, but, uh, and, but there are some characteristics that are shared by some Asian cities, uh, and so they claim that cities have the same way as we do have our personalities, cities also have their personalities, and those personalities are related to, to the culture of a specific society and also to, to relate to climate, uh, climate and weather, uh, relate to the environment and things like that. Uh, so it's an interesting paper also. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Again, you're much quieter than I, than I wish you were. I will just comment that uh, about PEPs. I saw, but I tried to search it right now, but I didn't find. But uh, I think Google Maps is now pro a plan to provide a route about safety. 
Mm. So either by walking to not walk in dangerous parts of the crime, but also in the road for, to avoid accidents, uh, less less traffic, not because it's faster, but because you are less uh, you, you run less uh, less risk of uh, an accident occurring. In, so there are many types of ways uh, or routes you can, you can choose. Well, notice that we, we already have in Google Maps, you already have the, even the possibility of deciding how do I want to go from here to there? On foot, by car, by bicycle, and of course the route is going to change because uh, uh, you know you, you can't ride a bike on some, some ways. Uh, and so uh, in, in the future, we will probably have uh, much more possibilities. So I, I do believe that uh, if, if, if Google people have not thought of it yet, uh, they, at some stage, they will come. Uh, uh, they will get to, to, to ideas like that. One of the researchers that, that that were studying the the path to happiness, and they will say, "Well, this is easy for us to do, right? It may have been more difficult for not not not, not much more difficult for for Quercia and and her colleagues because because they were using actually uh, uh, I think that they they were using some um, uh, I think they used some classification on the images." Yeah, but but but, but they, they used classic classification, and, and they were they were using uh, even to, of course, they were collecting uh, images from I think it was Flickr, uh, but uh, but afterwards they were using I don't know if it was open I think they were using open maps to 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 help decide uh, the the, the no, knowing the place the, the several places then to, to guide people, but it's much easier for Google that already has all the you know the searcher, the, the, the searcher they, they already have the old infrastructure there to so simply change the algorithm a little bit. Uh, to to show you either to show you historical monuments or to I, I want to go through a pass that shows me the and of course it makes more sense for people that are that are walking so and, and a little uh, distances that are not that that large but at the same time if you're going to from one place to the other uh, do you want to take the, the freeway or or do you want to to go slowly but see places that are more let's say authentic uh, and that are not just you know you don't want to see just gas stations and uh, and, and and parking area rest uh, parking areas where you can rest for a while. You want to to see small towns and things like that. So, yeah, this 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 are, these are all possibilities for 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 the future. But at the same time, it will all depend also on on uh, on, on where we go with respect to the the amount of data. Nowadays, we still can collect a lot of data. I mean, the, the, I'm sure that the way that we were collecting data from Untapped. Uh, and, and, and the way we can collect data from all, all these social networks that are still very open uh, in the future, people may get more concerned about that and say, look, this cannot be that open. So there may be also some, we'll have to figure out at how far we want to go, uh, depending on how, how, how much we also, by collecting that data and by, and by analyzing that data, how much we are, we are exposing people's uh, privacy also. Right, any questions for you guys who are, who are online? I was saying at the beginning of the class that, well, it, it's good that now I have a, a much larger, a larger crowd than, than I had right at the beginning. Uh, I, I fear that you are too passive here. I, I wished you were more, you participated more. Uh, I understand that language is a, a barrier sometimes. It is, I mean, you, you see how much I have to go around sometimes to explain something. Uh, but this is our pos the possibility we have to do that. Uh, and um, and we should uh, we should benefit from it. Okay, so what we will do for, for b b before we, uh, just after the break, we will we'll get to our Moodle to to discuss a little further uh, the ideas of maybe the major paper here. But we, we of, of course for those of you who had the chance of reading one of the others, you can also include it there. Uh, but I just want to show you uh, where we go next. Our next class is going to be next week, and it's about. This question here, uh, okay, where are we going with all these possibilities? Not the possibilities of collective intelligence, but the possibilities of urban computing and social computing and harnessing all this information that people leave behind the social networks. Is this providing us social empowerment or does it contribute to, to what we call totalitarian surveillance? And totalitarian surveillance means, in many cases, the government controlling uh, the people but, uh, and you could say, well, the government, uh, the, 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 our government doesn't want to control us. But uh, will our next government want to control us? One of the things that we notice is that social networks do uh, create, let's say, uh, some unbalance in, in our democracies. Uh, I am, 
You know, I'm, I'm a critical of, uh, of our, of, of, of the governments that we had in the last 30 years at least. Uh, so I'm not, it's not that I'm, I'm a critical of the right or the left, and I never know what right and left mean. I'm sorry, but I don't, uh, at least not with what is proposed by our politicians. But I do get scared when, uh, when we see that our democratic, uh, let's say, society uh, becomes challenged, sometimes from inside, from people that we, uh, that were elected by, by our community, let's say, by, by, by our society, and then, uh, and then uh, we see democracy sort of uh, being reduced to something that is not necessarily what we expect it to be, in, terms, in, in several terms, even in terms of you know, the relationship uh, among humans, uh, the, the way we, we treat and are treated by our neighbors, uh, the level of tolerance that we have to difference and so on and so forth. So I get scared with the possibility of, of a total, totalitarian surveillance because I see this as a possible outcome of any of the, 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 the forces that we have in what we still call our democratic society, right? Uh, we are not democratic any longer. We are not democratic when we, we can't bear the, the difference between our way of thinking and our neighbors. Uh, so we are, we, we are all trying to somehow impose our ideas on others. Uh, and at the same time, I don't think we, we do have ideas that are very different. We just choose, it seems that we just choose uh, our leaders the same way as we choose the soccer teams we're going to support. It's been crazy. Uh, and uh, I think that in any direction, there is a risk of totalitarian surveillance that we should, as citizens, we, we should try to, to avoid. And the way of avoiding that is by, um, you know, as a society, deciding how far we want to go with uh, the, the, the uses of, of the technologies that we have available today and, and that we will have available in the future. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back in, in 20 minutes. Uh, so the, the, the readings for, for, for next week are Harari 2020. Uh, there is uh, this Obama's memorandum on, on transparency. Please read that. It's short, but it's it's it's, it's interesting. We have from e-government, e-government, we government, uh, uh, and uh, I think you could also read this Open Government 2.0. Uh, so we, we have plenty of reading for 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 next week. Mm -hmm.